I've used a lot of food safe finishes over the years and while I haven't used them all, I think I've used enough that I could probably make some decent recommendations. The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Typebond. So what I have for you today is not exactly an exhaustive test, but it's one that stems from the materials that I'm most familiar with, and I wanted to do a test to compare them. The thing is, when I come up with these test ideas, a lot of times it's just born from my own curiosity. How does this compare to this? So that's what I've got for you today, the things I use most often. What I have here is mineral oil, walrus oil, tried and true varnish oil, and tongue oil. And we'll also be looking at the impact of using something like a food safe solvent such as citrus solvent. So let's take a step back and talk about what we're actually looking for out of food safe finishes. Primarily water resistance. I mean if you're putting any kind of meat or vegetables or anything that's wet onto these surfaces or using you know spatulas like this for stir frying you just don't want them to absorb a bunch of liquids from the food and the things you're exposing it to. Now these things don't have to be completely sealed. We don't want to necessarily encapsulate them in plastic, but the more they resist water and other juices, the less we have to deal with the wood getting rough and gross with repeated use. Excessive absorption of liquids can make kitchen items look bad, smell bad, and it shortens their life. So resisting moisture is clearly important, but there's another factor and that's maintenance. A finish that resists moisture for one meal but then requires reapplication is a big pain in the butt. So for me personally, I'm looking for the least maintenance possible. So let's take a closer look at the four finishes that I have here. First, we'll start out with that classic food safe finish mineral oil. It's inexpensive, ranging from 13 to 30 cents per ounce, depending on the brand and the quantity. It's widely available, sold in grocery stores and pharmacies. It's generally considered to be safe, and it's the basis for pretty much all commercially available butcher block oils on the market. You can also mix the oil with other oils and even waxes to make yourself a nice little paste. Well, after you hear all that, it kind of sounds like the perfect food safe finish, but stay tuned to find out why I actually think it is probably the worst finish we have available. Next Next up is Walrus Oil's Cutting Board Oil. It's a mineral oil based solution with other things added to it. It's all natural, in fact all their products, and they make a pretty wide range of products, are all natural, food safe, even their furniture finishes, which is pretty cool. But this is specifically their cutting board oil. It contains mineral oil, coconut oil, beeswax, and vitamin E. Now I just gotta say, I respect the heck out of a company that is willing to list all the ingredients of everything that's in the bottle. Most finishing companies want you to think that they have bottled unicorn tears. And look, as we all know, unicorns do not have tear ducts. This stuff ranges from 51 cents an ounce to $1.25 an ounce, depending on the amount you buy. You can find it online, as well as at select specialty retailers. While you certainly could mix it with wax, you really don't have to, because it already contains it. Now, the next finish is one that I've used quite a bit, and as you can see, I buy it in a very large quantity, and that's tried and true varnish oil. But don't be distracted by the word varnish in the title. This stuff is 100% food safe, contains polymerized linseed oil and natural resins, and doesn't build a thick film like a traditional resin finish would. Now when I say polymerized oil, that's an important detail. Polymerization, while it's a fancy science word, actually just means the linking together of oil molecules to create a more durable layer. Essentially, that's the finish as it cures. Now, if you've ever seasoned a cast iron skillet, you know all about polymerization. You just may not realize that's what you've done. You put a thin layer of oil, you heat it up to a certain point, it polymerizes, it becomes hard and dry. So polymerization is actually a very good thing when it comes to oils. Now, tried and true oil has this term polymerized on there. So if this were truly a polymerized oil, it would probably just be like a solid block of goo. That's what happens with polymerization, but it's clearly still liquid. So what did they do? Well, I don't know. This is one of those things where sometimes companies use terms for marketing. Sometimes they actually do have a legit process. Maybe it was an air exposure or an oxygen exposure that kind of helped kickstart the polymerization or maybe even a heat treatment that helps to kick off that polymerization. But I can tell you in practice, this stuff really just behaves like any other raw oil. So I haven't even seen any evidence that that polymerization makes a huge difference and I guess I just keep buying it because I hope it's doing something <laughs> but I don't necessarily have proof. So this stuff runs about 78 cents an ounce to $1.62 an ounce depending on the size. It's available online and sometimes at woodworking retailers. It's food safe according to the manufacturer and you can easily heat it up and mix it with wax. And last we have a classic woodworkers favorite, tongue oil. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
All right, not that kind of tongue. Uh, this is a food safe drying oil that comes from pressing the seeds of the tongue tree. Now you do have to be very careful with labeling when it comes to tongue oil because a lot of Finnish companies will outright lie on their labels. Avoid things that are labeled as tongue oil finish as they're most likely just diluted varnish. Instead, only buy 100% pure tongue oil. If it doesn't say that, don't buy it for food finishes. And when you open it up, you should be able to smell sort of a, a musky, oily scent. It should not be a harsh chemical odor. It should also be pretty viscous and not loose and runny. The price ranges from 58 cents an ounce to $1.15 an ounce. It's available from various brands at numerous vendors online and you could find the stuff at woodworking stores as well. It's considered food safe and it also mixes easily with waxes. Now I know I'm going to get questions about hard wax oils. Companies like Rubio, Osmo, Odie's Oil, these companies generally say that at least some of their finishes are food safe once they're cured. So here's the thing, should you use them? Well, that's totally up to you. Lots of people do, and if nobody has problems, that's great. Uh, for me personally, um, my background is in science. I always wanna know what's in a thing, especially if it's something that may contact my food or my family's food and end up in our bodies. So these companies love to have their proprietary formulas. They don't wanna tell you what's in there. And as a result, I don't wanna put it in my body. It's a two-way street, right? If you want me to do it, you need to let me know what's in there and then I could make an informed decision. So I'm not saying those finishes aren't safe. I'm just saying until they wanna let me know what's actually in it, I'm not gonna take the chance, but you can do whatever you think makes the most sense. And with regard to safety, I should probably also talk about solvents. I mentioned them earlier. Generally speaking, in woodworking, anything that we typically call a solvent is not something you wanna put in your body at least if you wanna stay alive. But adding solvents to some of these oils can actually be very beneficial from a finishing perspective as it thins the finish out, allowing it to penetrate deeper and allowing the oil to go on thinner, which helps promote the curing process. Well, thankfully, there are a few food grade solvents out there that are generally recognized as safe by the FDA, like this citrus solvent. It comes from natural products. In fact, it's made from orange peels. It smells great too. Now, while you obviously don't want to gulp this stuff down, uh, it is still safe to mix with oils. Once it hits the surface, it just evaporates and helps that oil penetrate deeper into the wood fibers. And when it's all said and done, there's really nothing left on the surface as far as the solvent is concerned. The reason I bring this up though is because I'm going to be using this with two of our finishes here to help dilute them to get the best out of the finish. And I just wanted to make sure we were clear on what exactly this stuff is. So again, like always, look it up for yourself, look at the results, look at what the FDA says about it and then make a decision if it's right for you. Now the first test I wanted to run has to do with drying. Now in the previous information I would label the oils as either drying or non-drying. There's no tricky terminology here that is literal. Either the oil dries or it always stays wet and that's going to be an important factor. But to test this I basically put a little bit of oil onto a piece of plexiglass, just a few drops each, spread it around so it gets good contact to oxygen so that if it is a curing oil it can cure and then I let it sit. Now I only planned on letting it sit for a few days but I got so preoccupied with house shopping and shop shopping and packing that the, this thing had a couple of weeks. So it's pretty dirty, a little bit dusty, looks gross, but let's take a look at the results. So first let's look at the mineral oil and you can see it's still very much liquid. I mean, it's obviously got a lot of dirt in it now, so it's super gross, but ultimately it's really in the same state that it was at the point that it was applied. Maybe just a little bit goopier at this point. Next up is walrus oil. And remember, walrus oil is really just mineral oil with other things in it, other additives. And this also has a similar goopiness and is still very much wet. Now for the tried and true varnish oil, we have a very different result. This almost looks a little bit like a cured polyurethane. It still has a softness to it, maybe a slight tack, but it's definitely dry. There's no spreading of this on the surface. So you can see very, very different results when it's a drying oil. And then finally, the tongue oil mixture, you can see that is also very much dry, nice and firm. I don't really feel much in the way of tackiness at all from this, but there is a softness. It's not like a hard polyurethane layer. You also notice it kind of has this um, a craze to the surface. Is that what that's called? Basically where the oil cures fast and kind of just bunches up on itself, which is something that can happen with pure oils. They get wrinkly and a little bit uh, gross looking, but this is a thicker layer than you would ever normally apply to a food item. So still very dry. So what these observations tell us is that the mineral oil containing finishes never really cure. They always stay in a liquid state. But the polymerized linseed oil and the tongue oil do cure to something, let's not call it a film, because technically they're not film forming finishes. It's a film like layer when it finally cures and polymerizes. 
So how does all this impact food items and why does it make me think that mineral oil is the worst choice of the bunch? Well, primarily because it stays wet. The fact that it's wet means it goes into the wood fibers, you know, it somewhat bonds to the wood fibers as much as it can, but it's still in a liquid state. And that means from that point, it only has a couple places to go. It either rubs off in use, which means it's going off onto your food, or it comes off during some sort of a cleaning. And because the oil is always in a liquid state, it's gonna do that process more readily, which means you're going to have to reapply it a lot more often. Another aspect we need to consider about these oils is performance. Now, I bad mouth mineral oil a little bit already, but what if it just performs great and it works the best out of all these? Well, then maybe some of these other issues are just non-issues. So I think it's time for a bit of a torture test. Let's do it. I took four small pieces of jatoba, a wood that I really like to use for wood utensils, and sanded them up to 220 grit. Before adding oil to a food item that's likely to get wet, it's a good idea to pre-raise the grain by exposing it to water. Once it dries, you can lightly sand again with 220 and then apply your oil. Each oil was applied a total of four times over the course of a couple of weeks, giving each coat a reasonable amount of dry time. Now, I didn't film it, but some of the applications of the mineral oil products, I did a sort of flood treatment. It's very common to do. Some people even have a dip tank that they put their cutting boards in, let it soak up all at once, and then take it out. One thing to be aware though, when you do that process, especially if it's like an end grain board or a very porous wood, it will pull a lot of oil in. And then what happens? Because the oil doesn't dry, it doesn't cure, it eventually will leach out. So there have been times where I've made that mistake, even with other oils, where I put too much on, and then it's just leaching oil out for days, sometimes weeks, before it all comes out. So just be careful if you're gonna do a flooding method, know what you're getting into. All right, so I think the only thing left to do is to uh, torture some wood. I'm going to boil all of the samples for five minutes. And that includes an unfinished piece as a control. So why boiling water? Well, most utensils are only gonna see a saute pan and testing these things under normal usage would take a very long time to get meaningful results. But boiling water is gonna be pretty effective at encouraging the finish to let go of the wood while also allowing the water to aggressively penetrate the fibers. Honestly, if any of them survive unscathed, I'll be surprised, but let's see what happens. After five minutes, I remove the pieces and let them dry on their own overnight. And here are the results. Let's take a look. So this is raw mineral oil, walrus oil, tried and true, and tongue oil. And I have the submerged portions here at the top. So of course the raw, you know, it's gonna feel fairly rough. And that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at its appearance, and then I'm also feeling it. Now you can't feel it, but I'm gonna try to translate for you. You can see also the raw wood tends to soak up more from the steam and the boiling bubbles. So it just kind of looks a little bit grody. But this part down here, yeah, a little bit rough. Now here's the thing, Jatoba, the reason I'd like to use this for utensils is it doesn't really have a lot of grain raising, even when it gets exposed to water. So while on other species, this would feel, you know, like 60 grit sandpaper. It's actually still fairly smooth, just not as smooth as the freshly sanded stuff. So that's our control. Now let's go to the mineral oil. And you can see up here, a color change between the area that is freshly oiled and the area that's been exposed. That just means that the oil was pulled out and sort of leached out of the wood fibers and a little bit of roughness, but again, Jatoba, really smooth stuff for the most part. So what we're looking at is the loss of finish here. The walrus oil, not too surprising. Comparable results to regular mineral oil. If anything, I would say it's maybe just a little bit smoother. I mean, in fact, I almost feel no roughness at all on this one. But I have to say, I mean, it looks pretty much like the same loss of finish in terms of how much the wood let go of during that process. And then next we have tried and true. This was a bit of a surprise. I've used tried and true for years on food items and I've never gotten stellar results. It just seems to work. I know it's food safe, so I continued using it. But this kind of tells me what's going on here. You could see a dramatic change in what was on the surface before and what was in the fibers before to after the exposure. I mean, there's almost nothing left other than you know dark pore pockets here. So that's a very interesting and to me surprising result. But then my whole hypothesis here and why I wanted to do this test in the first place was to show you guys why tongue oil is different. Look at that. I could feel a little bit of roughness here in the wood. So it definitely did have some water penetration there, but not a significant amount. And as you can see, just visually, it really hasn't lost a whole lot of color. In fact, if I flip this guy around and moved it, you might not be able to tell me which portion was submerged and which one wasn't. So this is one of those things, just visual and sort of tactile evidence that tells me this piece 
still is with finish intact and is probably in the best condition out of all of these samples. So I think a really cool follow-up test to this, and maybe some of you guys can do it and report back, I think the results will be a lot more dramatic if we use the domestic species, something like cherry. A lot of people make spoons and cutting boards out of cherry. This stuff just wouldn't fare as well to torture tests. You know, Jatoba is just incredibly durable, also known as Brazilian cherry. This sample, in fact, came from flooring that my neighbor put into their house and it had some extra pieces. Um, so it's great for making utensils, but it's incredibly durable. The results would look a lot more dramatic if we were using something like cherry. So I don't know, maybe in the future we'll do something like that. But even with the Jatoba samples, you can kind of draw conclusions. Number one, I'm gonna say that uh, you might be able to go naked. There are some species that are just durable enough, they resist the penetration of water enough that you may not need any oil at all. I think generally speaking, oil is always a good idea, it's gonna make things last longer, but this Jatoba is really tough stuff and this sample held up pretty well, so sometimes naked might be an option. And my second observation has to do with the differences between mineral oil and walrus oil. Now it's not too surprising, I mean the walrus oil is primarily mineral oil with some other stuff in it. We're talking about their cutting board oil. They also make a bunch of other products including tongue oil, straight up mineral oil, furniture finishes. So you definitely want to go there and check out their product line because if you're looking for those all natural finishes, it's a great company. I love those guys. But in this particular test, comparing straight up mineral oil to walrus oils, cutting board oil, I couldn't really see a difference, but this is a very limited test and there are probably other ways that we could test these products to expose more differences between them, but I just didn't see it here. Now my third observation is a surprise and quite frankly a disappointment. I really expected tried and true varnish oil to perform better than this. Being a drying oil, I didn't think it would be all that different from the tongue oil, and as you can see, in terms of its transformation with the loss of finish from the surface, it looks worse than some of the mineral oil finishes that we uh, looked at. So more experimentation is always called for with these things when you find a negative result. And I don't wanna throw companies under the bus because of one goofy test, but this sort of reinforces what I've seen in my own kitchen where I kind of expected to get better results and just didn't. And I you know, always assumed it was just the way things were until I found the next thing, which is my fourth observation. So observation four, tongue oil rocks. Like this stuff is amazing. This just confirms what I've been seeing in my own kitchen and just kind of thought maybe it was my imagination. Is the finish really lasting longer? I don't have to apply it as often to my cutting boards. In fact, I had a cutting board that was finished with this stuff, which kicked this whole experience off. My buddy Alex Snodgrass, who makes these cutting boards, he made me a big one, and he finished it with a mixture of tongue oil and citrus uh, solvent, and the finish lasted like a couple years. It was a, a long time, and I asked him, did you put varnish on that cutting board? Why did this last so long? And he told me what it was. So I've known about tongue oil for ages. I've used it on projects in the past, but I just thought it was like boiled linseed oil, right? But when I put it on my other food items and started to observe how they behave over time, how easy they are to clean after usage, how much grain raising there is, I was really impressed and that's what spurred on this test in the first place. I mean, look at this sample. It just, I mean, there's a little line from the boiling here, but overall, it really looks complete. It doesn't look like the finish has worn off at all and it's a night and day difference compared to the other samples in this test. Now, just to be clear, I'm not saying that mineral oil is bad. People have been using it for ages. People who know a lot more about finishing food items than I do have been using it for ages. So it definitely works. What I'm saying is there's a better option. Now, whether it makes sense for you to go with a tongue oil option or not, that's totally up to you. But my observations, my personal recommendation is that tongue oil is gonna be superior in pretty much every way except for cost. It's a more expensive oil. But ultimately, if I don't have to apply it as often, cost sometimes works its way out in the end uh, to be a bit of a wash, but it's really not that expensive anyway, and you don't apply much to the surface in the first place. So I don't really see cost as a huge factor for me personally. Do whatever makes sense for you. Always do the research and do some experiments, because guess what? You know, we always talk about the statistical significance of things that we do here on YouTube. Obviously, this isn't statistically significant, but it supports my observations over the years, so I have faith in the results that I had. Test it for yourself. Grab some wood, get the finishes, and let me know what you get with your results. All right, so thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed this little experiment. Uh, we had to torture some poor pieces of wood, but I think they'll survive, and I guess I'll catch you next time. Well, most utensils are probably only... Well, most utensils are probably only going... Jeez, my lips work, I swear. And it should when you open the... Oh, <clears throat> hold on. <laughs> okay, got it.